All right, welcome back to Ace Academy. Let's load in. And uh, let's have this conversation. Let's see who the fuck has the information about my core. Hello? Hi, I'm the Riddle, one of the pilots for Ace 204911. Yes, I'm familiar with you and your team. How can I help you? I had some questions relating to Akira's core overdrive. Unfortunately, I can't help you. I'm only involved in the team side of things. You'll have to talk to someone in the tech and engineering department. I see. Is there a person I can get in touch with? Your best bet would be to try calling Eludian's main number and setting up an appointment. Alright, thanks. Good luck. After reading up the call, I quickly locate Eludian's number. I'm going to get my irritation and check and wait for someone to answer. Finally, I reach a receptionist, who helpfully inquires if I have an appointment or if I'd like to make an appointment. Realizing I was going to get nowhere, I make an appointment to visit the office tomorrow. I'm exhausted and I've made no progress with getting answers. I text my team what happened and find them waiting on the quad. Valerie and you and I are there too. Show got us up to speed. With how long it took me to activate your overdrive mode, Eludian has got to be working with a prototype or have access to your core's blueprints. Those are my thoughts exactly, but how did they? How would they have gotten those uh, schematics? I didn't give it to them. Promise. I give her a weak grin. No, not what I was implying, but still good to know. Yeah, still, that sucks, Brosive. Why not? I'm a little surprised the account manager doesn't know that information. You don't look thoughtful. I think for larger companies like Eludian, it makes sense. The account managers are the liaison between the sponsor and the sponsee, so that's their main focus. They make sure the team gets what was supposed to go to them, so they don't need to know how that item was acquired or developed in the first place. The only time you see a lot of interdepartmental duties is when you're with smaller companies. Does Dashu have a similar model as Eludian? Oh yes, definitely. Especially since they sponsor more than one industry. Well, I have an appointment scheduled for tomorrow. Hopefully that'll be more successful. Good. It's easier to demand answers in person. Demand? Pretty sure that's how you get kicked out of a place. He's got to be aggressive if he wants to get any answers. Otherwise, they'll keep passing him off from one person to the next. Something weird is going on, though. I intend to find out what. My voice holds more confidence than I feel. I can't quiet the sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Yuna nods and speaks gently. For now, you should try not to stress about it. Yeah, there's not much you can do. You're right, I know. I think I'm going to head home then. Everyone agrees. My young career look equally exhausted. Even show doesn't move as much. Doesn't have as much energy as usual. Friday's been unusually quiet, and Yuna looks solemn. This loss weighs heavy on everyone. Crazy, goodbyes. And I head to the parking lot. Then I open my bike and head home. I'm Kaito and Nikki are both sitting on the couch watching TV when I arrive. Hi, I'm Kaito. Hey, Nikki. N uh, Kaito grins at me. Welcome back. How was your match? Actually, it. Finally, you're home. I thought you were going to miss it. Miss what? The monsters, of course. Did you forget? In all the excitement of today, I completely forgot about the Moscars. My expression must have given away my thoughts because Nikki shakes her head. I forgot. Whoops. And seriously, how could you forget when your favorite actor, Leonardo DiCaprio, was nominated? To be fair, he's been nominated five times before. That's not the point, Uncle. I sit up between them on the couch just as the opening number starts. I only uh, partially pay attention for most of the nominations. Every so often I peek at Uncle Kaito and Nikki. Kaito looks about as against as I am, while Nikki is practically on the edge of her seat. Every so often she shout out who she hopes to win. Finally, it's the moment we've all been waiting for. The nominations for Best Actor. Do you know that Cap DiLaprio nominated for his role in the operation against a handful of people no one cares about? Uncle and I look over at each other in solidarity. Nikki leans so far forward in her seat, I'm afraid she's going to fall off. 
And the Mosker goes to. Oh my breath, I see an announcer rips open the envelope in the slowest way possible. Leonardo Delabrio. Nikki jumps up and screams while Kaito throws her fists in the air and shouts excitedly. That'll do, Leonardo. That'll do. I can't hold back my grin and a wave of pride washes over me. This was a long time coming. It's about time he was formally recognized for his talents. I can hardly believe it. Honestly, Nikki, I'm surprised you're excited about this. I didn't reali realize you liked him. Before I can answer, she shows me. Oh, he's about to give his speech. We watch as Sionado gracefully accepts the Moscow and runs through his list of thanks. And finally, I'd like to mention how thankful I am uh, that we take a good look at global warming back in 2016, so everyone can still enjoy the wonders of snow. The audience roars with applause as Theo walks off the stage. What a classy guy. Yeah. Nikki gets back on her feet. Anybody want a snack? Kaito perks up. I wouldn't say no to that. Same here. Mmm, snacks. Be right back. She runs off to the kitchen and returns with a plate full of strawberries. Ooh, strawberries. I heard you say the word snack. When Kaito face lights up as he grabs the closest one to him. Well, that station, he takes a huge bite, then catches himself as chocolate dribbles down his chin. Wait, is that chocolate? Yeah. I pick up a strawberry and pop it in my mouth. Mmm, cream filled. I also have some filled with gelatin and cookie butter. This is amazing. She beams. Do you really think so? Yes. I eat another strawberry in response. Where did you find this idea? I don't know. I was just thinking about how I wanted chocolate covered strawberries, but I hate when the chocolate comes off unevenly or the shell breaks off when you bite into it. I figured. This is a better yet still delicious alternative. I can confirm it is. Uncle Kaito eats another strawberry. Do you think you can make this at the cafe? Nikki's eyes glitter. Seriously? You think it's that good? Definitely. It's a simple twist on a familiar treat. I have no doubts it'll be well received. I'd be honored! Great! What do you want to call them? Strawberry dream. What about strawberry dream? Mm, that's not terrible. Oh, guy to look thoughtful. It's vague enough that it can encompass all the different filling options. Hmm. We'll think about it. Right. Well, since nobody here seems to appreciate my genius, I'm going to bed. It is getting late. Uncle guy to stiffles a yawn. Yeah, I think I'm going to turn in too. He starts to get up, then pops the last strawberry into his mouth. I thought you were going to bed. I couldn't leave the poor thing to live on that plate all alone. Better that he's with his friends. Yep, definitely time for me to go to bed. Nikki giggles. After I help her clean up the kitchen a bit, I head upstairs and dream of dessert. The familiar sound of my alarm wakes me up. I turn it off and rub the eye uh, the sleep from my eyes. Why did I set my alarm when I don't have any classes today? Oh right, I want to get some studying done. Sibling and yawn, I force myself out of bed and head to the washroom to get ready. Once I've gone through my morning routine, I'm a lot more awake and ready to hit the books. I crack open my first textbook and decide to give myself a mini quiz. I feel more and more energized with each answer I get correct. I'm confident that exams next week will be a breeze. After a couple of hours, my eyes are starting to cross uh, and I need a break. There's still a lot of time before my Illudian meeting that afternoon. I wonder if anyone is free. Show is the only one, okay. Just as I decide what I want to do, I get a phone call from Show. What's up, Brazov? No. Jeez, I pulled a phone away from my ear. What do you mean, no? You can't call me Brosif. Brosif is your name, Brosif. Uh, okay. What's up? What are you doing this fine evening? I don't have any... Uh, <laughs> I don't have any specific plans. Excellent. I'll meet you at the Izokaze Park. Wait, what? What's going on at the park? You'll see. See you in a few. He hangs up before I can pry for more. 
whatever it is, if Show's excited, uh, then this has got to be fun. Uh, I hop on my bike and drive to the park. A uh, tantalizing sense of food wafted towards the street, enticing passerby. As I search for a parking space, the park is illuminated by hanging lanterns and packed full of stalls. Is this some type of festival? Joe Ling is in the outskirts of the park and runs over to me. There you are, Brosif. What's all this? It's a festival, of course. Yeah, but which one? He looks incredible. In incredulous? Okay, sure. Jeez, you don't know? No. Should I? Of course. Everyone knows it's the festival of Dongos. Huh? You have no idea, do you? I just told you. They sell all kinds of Dongo here. But why is there even a festival where they can sell Dongo? Dango? Whatever. He blinks. Does it matter? Now come on! Wait, aren't we going to wait for the others? Show scratched the back of his head. This might just be a two man operation. Huh? But you have a girlfriend. Uh, wouldn't you prefer going with, you know, Mayu? You're joking, right? It's reading week. She has me constantly studying and studying only. It's like being on house arrest, man. I barely managed to escape. He waves his arms around for emphasis. I mean, what you're doing isn't necessarily bad. I know, but sometimes it's good to just recharge the mental battery, you know? I figured the others would get on my case, but I can trust you, Brosif. Sounds more like you thought I wouldn't be studying. <laughs> Was I wrong? I wouldn't say that. He grins. Then let's get started. The Adventures of Brosif and Show. I nod. Show seems to be in an extra good mood. We enter the front of people and browse the different stalls. The area sells all sorts of crafts and clothing. A small doll dressed in a fitted kimono catches my attention. I stop show and inspect it further. The wooden doll has black has hair as black as night. And a dainty face with blushing cheeks and red lips. Hey show. What? Look at this. What do you think? He glances at the doll and gives me a stranger's look. It's fine. Do you think Maya would like that? Oh, he looks thoughtful. Hmm, actually, she might. Oh god, are we going to gift shop? Are, are we going to gift shopping? I'm sure she'd be happy if you brought her back a souvenir. Yeah. Oh, wait, then she'll know I wasn't studying. She's going to find out no matter what. At least this way you can say you were thinking about her. You're right. Smart thinking, Brosif. She wants to vendor the price for the doll and pays it. Then happily turns away. Ready for some food? Always. That's what I like to hear. We move away from the craft area straight into the sea of small eels. Eats. Whoops. Show can decide on what to order. Uh, on what to order to end up ordering one of each item. His arms are full of more dango than dango. Whatever. I really have issues. Uh, that one man can eat. Uh, I managed to stop him before he applies the same tactic to each vendor and convince him to eat what we have first. We sit down along the edge of the park at the picnic tables. As we settle in, a set of twins approaches. Hey boys, are these seats taken? Oh boy. Although their faces are nearly identical, one girl has thick straight hair with flowers in a glossy waterfall down her back and it ends right above her ample bottom. The second girl plays her curls and lets them bounce between her full, full bosom. Ah. Uh, they follow your smiles, revealing cute dimples. Then sit across from us and set down their drinks. It's really nice of you to save the seeds. They seem to be around our age. The girls look at Chill with interest and they play with the straw in the drinks. Do you go to Ace? Considering Ace is the only diversity around here, it's not unusual. I, it's not an unusual guess. Um. He seems dazed. Yeah, he's in a pilot program. Pilots. Sure not, still as confused as before. He should be quick questioning glances as if unsure whether to whether or not this act this is actually happening. He is so out of his element so out of his elements, Jesus fuck. The girls look at each other then giggle. What are you doing after the festival? Would you want to hang out? 
She was eyes wide and looks at me in astonishment. He looks like he's about to agree when he quickly shakes his head. Actually, we have plans with our girlfriends later tonight. Aww, really? Show sure not, I don't more reluctantly this time. Both of you are already taken? Oh well. Struggling, she scribbles something on a napkin and tucks it into Sho's hand. Her fingers linger on Sho and she leans in close and speaks in a bravey voice. Well, if you guys ever want to hang out, I'm sure we'll be available. They slowly return to their feet and purposely give us uh, an eyeful of their chest. As they walk away, they exaggerate the hypnotic sway of their hips. What just happened? Ah, the magic of not being single. You don't know? She looks at me with intrigue. You're forbidden fruit now, Mr. Shinjiro. He blinks. Huh? What do you mean? Not that you spoke not that you spoken for. Uh, get ready for a lot more attention from girls, my friend. That doesn't make any sense. How would they know I already have a girlfriend? We just met. They've got a secret sense for these things. You know how women are. Show not. They have a lot of secret senses. I remember reading that once you're in a relationship, you carry yourself more confident. You don't appear desperate or needy, which makes you more appealing. But who wants to talk about that psychological, psychological mumbo jumbo? I think that was a fluke. A fluke? Yeah, I've tried so hard to get a girl's number before and met with a 0% success rate. This was just a random outlier. Hmm. You don't sound convinced. You're not wrong. Okay, here, watch. Now watch his show stands, he spots another girl around her age, uh, waiting in line to get some food, and approaches her. They chat for a bit, but uh, when a girl pulls out her phone, show looks shocked. He furiously shakes his head and retreats back to me as the girl sadly looks on. What was that all about? I tried to get her number, and then she was about to give it to me? What is happening? The younger me would have killed for this power! This power that I cannot use! <laughs> I put Sho in the back. Uh, I don't know what to tell you, man. Sho sings into his chair and sniffles. I never thought I'd see the day where Sho will be sad that the girls aren't him. We spend the rest of the evening checking out the festival and fending off single girls, much to Sho's anguish. Once we've seen everything there is to see, we go our separate ways and I head home. It's almost time for my apartment with all uh, Eludian. I drive a bike downtown and park near Ludian Enterprises. The building, is the building is impressive as the sunlight reflects off the tinted windows. Ludian's uh, signage is posted on the front entrance. It's large enough to be seen from a distance, but isn't as gaudy as Robtech's signature. Uh, signage. The receptionist cheerfully greets me when I enter. I let her know my name and it's not long before I'm led into an engineer's office. He just for me to have a seat, which I accept. Thank you for agreeing to meet with me. My pleasure. How may I be of assistance? I have a question about the core overdrive techno technology scene at Ace Academy's match yesterday. What questions? And ask an easy question to test what you tell me. How is, that how is that technology enabled? I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to divulge company secrets. Uh, my apologies if the question wasn't clear. I meant to ask how Akira was able to enable the overdrive mode through the match. Yes, I understand. Unfortunately, that is not something I am at liberty to share. Even Akira was able to give me that information. How come this man won't? Something strange is going on. Ask the question I'm dying to know. How are we able to engineer the course overdrive mode? The technology is not common knowledge. I apologize, but I can't disclose company secrets. I should have seen that coming. If they're so tight-lipped, does that mean there is some shady business going on there? I'm not sure what's going on there. As far as I'm aware, the technology has not been made available. So how is that uh, addition silly built to Acura's gear? Again, I'm sorry, but that's not something I'm at liberty to discuss. Obviously, this conversation is going nowhere. My frustration increases and makes my tongue loose. You know what you can discuss? Then what can you discuss? So far that's been the only thing you've said. He frowns. I don't appreciate that tone. And I don't appreciate your face. Or... 
how do you call this? Silhouette? I don't appreciate you stringing me along like this. What did you agree to meet me if you had no intention of talking to me? If you ask me a question I am at liberty to answer, then I will gladly answer it for you. The only answer I need to know are the questions I've asked. I'm sorry, but it looks like I won't be able to help you. I cross my arms. I'm not leaving here without answers. Then I'm afraid I will have to call for security. I stare at him defiantly as he picks up the phone. In a matter of minutes, two body guards show up in the office. They each uh, grab hold of one of my arms and drag me out of the office. Let me go. I can't leave until I get some answers. What is the meaning of this? A tall man dressed in smart suit blocks the hallway. Why are the guards trying to forcibly remove this young man from the premises? We're just following orders, sir. I am the order here. The guys look at each other and release me. Thank you. The man turns to me. What is this all about? Although he spoke, he speaks softly. There's a clear air of authority around him. I don't dare act uh, presumably towards him, especially after he's given me a second chance to get my answers. I'm sorry, sir, but I came here looking for an answer to a simple question. What question? It's in regards to the overdrive core from the Ace Academy match yesterday. He studies me. You are a student here? Yes, a pilot. Come into my office. Perhaps I can help you. He dismisses the guards and leads me into the private office. With large windows, I read the plaque on his desk, which is twice the size of my own. Donnie Rose, CEO. I glance sharply at him, but he doesn't seem to notice. Why is CEO getting involved with that kind of dispute? He offers me a seat, which I take. I like how the music suddenly became tense. Maybe there's some kind of PR stunt. Although he seems helpful, I shouldn't let the guard down. Now, explain to me how I can help. I go through my explanation about the match yesterday. I mention who I am. He seems intrigued after hearing my name. You're the pilot of Eagle? Yes. Your gear caused quite a bit of intrigue in the R&D community with your unique core. Let's take, then how exactly was Eludian able to possess that technology? He raised an eyebrow as if I'm implying the answer is obvious. We partnered with Midori Energy to develop the core. Midori Energy supplied the schematics and of course the Eludian team worked hard to build and refine it. I blink. Midor Midori Energy? Does it mean Midori Energy Inc? That was that company. I'm surprised Dashu, being an energy drink company, was able to acquire the technology before it went to market. Something very weird is going on there, but I don't think Ludian is involved meticulously. Um, yeah, I guess Dashu has the sources. He smiles. I don't doubt it. The phone rings, interrupting a conversation. I'll have to take this. I nod on stand. Thank you very much for meeting with me. I appreciate your time. You're an interesting pilot. Perhaps our paths will cross again. Oh, they will. Something fishy is going on there. He nods at a smith and answers his phone while I leave the office. My mind is a whirlwind of questions as I leave the building and head back to my bike. Was Dad working on this score for my Dora Energy? I've always thought they had a project for the two of us, but if that's not the case, then maybe they had something to do with... I shake my head trying to free myself from these thoughts. I can't jump to conclusions. I need to clear my head and calm down. Maybe someone is free right now. I could use a distraction. Uh... Yuna. Yuna pops into my mind and I decide to give her a call. I wonder how she's spending her reading week. She answers the phone almost immediately. Um, hello? Hey, Yuna. Oh, I was in the middle of calling you when you called me. What a crazy coincidence. Ask your advice about something. About what? Well, it's more something you need to see. Would you like to come over? Sure, I'll be right there. Great, I'll see you soon. When we hang up, I head to my bike and drive to Yuna's house. At the park, I knock soundly on her door. There's a shuffling on the other side, and it takes her a while before she opens the door a crack. She slams the door shut again. Uh, that was strange. There are more noises on the other side of the door before Yuna flings it open. Hi. Hey. Oof. Oh boy. 
I stare at the wrangling ball of fur, trying to jump free from her arms. Puppy. I open my arms and you know let the pup hop into them. It still slaps my body with each whack as the puppy tries to plant kisses all over my face. You didn't tell me you had a dog. I'm just borrowing him for now. Borrowing? Yuna moves aside so I can enter and close the door behind me. Then she puts the puppy down. It scampers to my leg and pulls my feet as I carefully make my way to the couch. Yuna sits down beside me. Okay, not really borrowing. I've been volunteering at the local animal shelter since I moved to Isokaze. And when I found out they needed foster homes for some of their pets, I volunteered to take Mochi home with me. As you can tell, he loves people. And he's already been housebroken, so they don't think it'll be long before he gets adopted. Uh, Mochi tries fluidly to hop onto the couch and misses each time. After turning a few more times, he sits back with his haunches and whines. Yuna giggles and scoops him back up in her arms. Uh, he settles into her lap. How long have you had him? About a week. Actually, I wanted to ask you about that. Hmm? I'll have to give him back next week. But I don't really want to. Do you want to adopt him? She nods and fondly pats Mochi's head. The house doesn't feel so big and empty when he's around. I glance around the living room. The space is uh, conservatively decorated, but includes a lot of photographs of the family, antique vases, and cabinets tastefully fill the space. I wonder if these are family heirlooms or items passed down from generation to, uh, to generation. Looking at all the smiling faces of Yuna, Yudai, and the parents, I can understand why Yuna feels alone in such a big house. She's constantly reminded of the past. What did your parents say? Yuna bites her lip. I haven't told them yet. Not even about fostering a puppy? No. I'm not sure what they'll say. We used to have dogs back when we still lived in the countryside, so it's not like I don't know how to take care of them. Maybe they won't even notice. Moshi's uh, plush bed is in the corner where the kitchen and the living room correct. Compared to the rest of the decor, a uh, hitchcock of modern toys stick out like a sore thumb. I think they might. She frowns and furrows her brow. Moshi seems to sense her excitement, places her front paw on her chest to lick her face again. Mochi! She turns her face away but laughs. Just ask your parents. You just talk to your parents. I'm sure they don't understand if you told them why. She wrinkles her brow again, then nods. I suppose it can't be helped. They'd find out sooner or later. It sounds like you've already made up your mind. Maybe. She pauses. It's not that I'm worried my parents will say no. I don't think they'd be opposed to the idea. I just... I don't want them to think they're bad parents. I understand why they don't stay here for too long, and I don't want them to think I'm lonely. Are you lonely? It can be a little quiet. Mochi yips and hops off of Yuna's laps, he, uh, lap. He races towards his bed of toys, sliding on the hardwood floor. <laughs> I think he wants to play. Play took of war. Uh, Mochi grabs a fake braided rope in his mouth, and I grab the other and, and then lightly tug. Mochi pulls back, his tail still waggling. Uh, I increase the pressure, and Mochi pushes uh, his weight back onto the, his hind uh, legs, so his butt is in the air. He growls affectionately as he shakes his head back and forth. I gently let go, and my end of the rope uh, drops harmlessly on the ground. Mochi passes, then cocks his head to the side, as if asking what I'm doing. You were too strong. You know, giggles. Mochi, you won! Oops, now that he's all wound up, I should probably take him for a walk so he doesn't accidentally wet himself. Yeah, that wouldn't, wouldn't be. <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. Do you want to join? I glance out the window at the darkened sky. I should probably get back before it gets too late. You know, not. Thanks for coming over. No problem. Bye, Mochi. Or Mochi, whoops. Yuna picks up one of Mochi's paws and waves it around. Bye bye. <laughs> the girl of love with Mochi looks down at his paw in confusion. Yuna grabs the leash and secures it around Mochi's neck. Then we leave the house together. She heads towards the park while I head back to my bike and drive home.
When I arrive home, Yuki is rummaging through the drawers in the living room. She glances at me and grins. Oh, good, you're here. Where are your rubber bands? Huh? <laughs> rubber bands, I need them. Why? She just smiles. Do you know where they are? Yeah, they're in the bottom drawer of the table beneath the mirror. Yuki searches through the drawer and pulls out a rubber band. Thanks. I watch Akira as she wanders into the kitchen. She ties her rubber band around the nozzle sprayer next to the faucet. Afterwards, she grabs Akira's phone, which was laying unattended on the kitchen table. A big over her shoulder and watch her change his lock screen to a screenshot of his home screen. And then she puts the phone back down. I follow her back into the living room where she takes a seat and on the couch and flips through a magazine as if nothing just happened. What's going on? As soon as Kato comes out, I want you to block your number and call his phone. Why? Just do it. It'll be worth it. I shrug and join her on the couch. If you say so. We didn't have to wait long for Kaito emerges from the back room. I do as Anjuki asks and immediately call his phone. Yuki watches me closely as I do, then grins. Kato, are you going into the kitchen? Do you mind getting me a glass of water? No problem. Thank you. As soon as Kaito walks through the kitchen door, Yuki and I bolt off to the couch and creep uh, in the doorway to watch un to watch what unfolds. Kaito picks up an empty glass in one hand and his phone in the other. He puts the glass down beside the sink and is uh, as he focuses on his phone. When he turns to check the faucet, the rubber band forces the wire to spray out of the nozzle and it catches uh, Kaito all over his chest. He helps in surprise and quickly shuts off the water, then tries desperately to swipe his phone. Anjuki and I can't hold back our laughter and fall into a fit of giggles by the door, when Kaito looks increasingly worried as he can't get his phone to work. Yuki, this isn't funny. I think you damaged my phone. She's too busy laughing to answer. I think this will work. This is serious. Finally, Yuki composes himself. Herself. <laughs> Relax, your phone is fine. Clearly it's not. It's frozen. <laughs> no, it's not. Give it here. She plucks the phone out of his hand and unlocks it. He frowns his brown confusion. I just changed your wallpaper. Funny, right? I can't help but laugh at the expression on Kaito's face. Uh, it's relief plus irritation plus confusion rolled into one. My laugh makes Yuki wants to laugh, although she tries her best to keep a straight face in front of Kaito. <laughs> She breaks down into laughter. Soon even Kaito cracks a smile at both of us. One day, Yuki, you are going to give me a heart attack. Don't say things like that. I slowly compose myself and Kaito glances at me. You were in on this too? I thought you were on my side. Sorry, but Yuki's a fun one. She smiles and gives me a hug. Alright, fun one. Since this was all your fault to begin with, you should be the one to clean up the kitchen. Fair enough. Yuki goes to grab some towels on Kaito and I head into the living room. I should tell him about what I heard at Aladdin. Um, Kaito, I need to tell you something. It involves my dad. His smile drops. What is it? Yesterday, during a match with Akira's team, Akira's gear went into overdrive mode. The same overdrive mode your core can do? Yeah, I confronted uh, Aludian about it this afternoon when he told me that Midori Energy was the one who supplied him with the technology. Uncle um, Kaito looks grave. That was your father's company. Exactly. Was this technology a research project he was working on for the company? I don't know. He never mentioned anything to me about it while we were building Eagle. When I discovered Eagle had the ability, I assumed it was something that was created just for me. But now, I'm not so sure. Kaito nods. I'll have the PI investigate Midori Energy and see if there are any connections. Before I can respond, Anjika returns to the living room. How about a little TV time with my two favorite boys? I'm up for that. Same here. Is Nikki home? Not yet. She is such a busy bee. She can join us when she comes back. We throw in a movie, uh, and Uncle Kaito and Anjuki add their own commentary to what's going on. Normally, it will be annoying, but I'm just happy to see that they're getting along so well again. Eventually, Nikki comes home and snuggles between Kaito and Yuki on the couch. For the first time in a while, I feel like I'm part of a family again. It's not just Nikki and me anymore. Judging by Nikki's smell, I think she feels the same way. We watch to the late hours in the night, then I say my good night and go to bed. It's not long before I've drifted off to sleep. I 
I can hear both Kaito and Nikki downstairs. Does she not work today? I barely seen Nikki since she started working at the restaurant, and although I didn't have classes this week, I was still busy with school. Maybe we can catch up today. As soon as I head downstairs, Kaito and Nikki greet me with matching grins. It's like they were waiting for me. I have a bad feeling about this. Hey, bud. Sleep well last night? Uh, yeah, thanks. That's good. Feeling well rested? Yes. Great. The smiles don't budge. What's going on? Oh, nothing. We just had a small favor to ask. Yeah, so small, just teeny tiny. This doesn't sound promising. What is it? We're a little understaffed at one of our restaurants. Oh no! Oh no 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 no! More specifically, the one Nikki works at. No. Nikki not. No. We're hoping you could come and help out. Really? That's it? Uh, I guess I could help. I don't have any plans, plans right now. Kaito burns into a big grin. You stupid! Perfect! He said yes! <laughs> he can't back out now! What? Kaito raises towards the door. I'll be in the car. Come out when you guys are ready! He disappears, leaving a nervous looking Nikki. What did he mean by ready? I narrow my eyes. Nikki? It's nothing. The restaurant's just doing a theme today. Oi. Oh no. Any theme is bound to be bad. What kind of theme? One of maids. In a cafe. You've got to be fucking kidding me. Maid cafe? She slides to the side of her rules in an pressed butler costume. No. <laughs> Not happening. Wordlessly, I turn around and head back up the stairs. Hey! Where do you think you're going? Somewhere that's not a maid cafe. She frowns. Really? Yes, really. Okay. Wait, that was too easy. Nikki looks down. Oh no, not this. I, I just thought that you'd want to spend some time with me. And it's just a tiny request. Oh no. But if you can't, it's okay, you can't. She ends with a series of sniffles. I've just absolutely face bombed. Ah, fine, I'll go. Nikki immediately perks up. Okay, good. Hurry up and get dressed. She grins and starts fussing with the outfit. How can she uh, do that so convincingly? Oh well, I guess there's no turning back now. I grab the outfit, then head to my room and get changed. Once I'm done, I look in the mirror. It might not be my first choice in outfits, but I still look pretty damn good. Nikki's waiting for me downstairs. Also, ow, that hurts. <laughs> Actually. Ah, oh, fuck. Nikki's waiting for me downstairs, dressed in her maid outfit. Looking sharp, big bro. Thanks, you're looking too bad yourself. Nikki grins. Let's not keep Kaito waiting any longer. I nod, and we both head out. As soon as I step into the car, Kaito's eyes widen as he chokes back a laugh. <laughs> That's a good look for you. What a guy. Where's your costume, uncle? He lost his laugh filled the car. Oh no, I'm not working. I'm just the chauffeur. Too bad. I bet you would have been a hit. Oh, there's no doubt about that. As soon as we arrive, Kaito waves goodbye and I follow Nikki in. Nikki introduces me to all her colleagues and they greet me with pleasant smiles. Everyone else is dressed up as well, which is comforting. A part of me was worried this was an elaborate hoax. The head butler gives me a rundown of the basics on how to act. I reminded of my high school days when I waited tables. It's very much the same thing with a lot more miss or sir strewn in. You all good? Uh, Nikki bugs her hand in our room just so we finish the training. Yep. She smiles. Uh, smirks. This is going to be so much fun. She grabs my hand and we head on out onto the floor. It's a little daunting at first, but the customers are thrilled and it's not long before we get into character. 
for Ivan's character, whoops. It is a lot more fun than uh, I originally thought. It, really? This is the first time I've seen Nikki at work. She uh, flits from table to table, charming everyone she meets. Most of the regulars request to be uh, placed in her section and are even willing to wait until her tables are free. Uh, I've even had a few of my tables ask if she could come over uh, so they could meet her. Whenever that happens, Nikki would happily oblige and show me a smug grin. Oh, it's on now. I won't beat them so easily. Now here's my butler game. Something I never thought I'd have to do. One step up uh, to the plate. At least now my customers aren't requesting for Nikki anymore. Ha! <laughs> As the guy fills up, we're getting loads of people. We somehow both end up at the same table. How can I serve you today? It would be my honor to serve you today. She shoots at him a big doe eyes and an endearing smile. Curses. In, in a battle of adorableness, I could never win. I would never win. Ah, it would seem like you're already in good hands. My apologies. I bow. The customers look at me with interest. Oh my, what a gentleman. Nikki gives me a dirty look when the table isn't paying attention. Then looks apologetic. Oh, um, I'm so sorry. You were here first. She pouts. Please forgive me. She's adorable. I'm losing them. No, no, it's okay. I insist. You carry attention is it is at the level I strive to achieve. You're too humble. Your ability to predict a customer's needs is commendable. Oh my goodness, what a cute couple. Couple? Couple? Uh, hold on. I think you have the wrong idea. Nikki, you finally did it! Oh boy. Even other people can see it. Oh boy. Nikki's eyes wide and as the two friends skip over. Are they stalking me? You guys, what are you doing here? Nikki's friends uh, look at each other, then giggle. It was only a matter of time before they kindled their relationship. I'm so happy for you two. They really are lovely together. Their outbursts catch the attention of other restaurant's patrons, and soon everyone is making comments about the lovely couple. You guys have it all wrong! Uh, yeah, we're actually brother and sister. The cafe goes silent. Wait, despite being siblings, they are true to their hearts? Oh no! Oh boy. That's even more romantic than I thought! Uh, as soon as I'm done for today. The red looks at each other and then starts clapping and cheering. No, no, no! Ugh. He's my brother! We're not in that kind of relationship! This isn't an anime! These things don't happen! She points at me. I do love my brother. The crowd cheers again. are trying to hint at will never ever ever be a thing nikki huffs and crosses her arms her message comes across loud and clear what about his dlc no despite the little bump in the day the rest of the shit goes well a lot of people would pull me aside and repeat i'm sorry she doesn't feel the same under cry that love can be so tough <sighs> Whatever that means. Uh, as we wait for the bus home, Nikki makes me promise never to speak of, the day of this day again. I'm all too happy to agree. When we arrive home, uh, Yuki and Kaito are sitting on the couch, huddled beneath a blanket. As soon as Kaito sees me, he grins. How was your day, bud? I hate you. Kaito, uh, Yuki and Kaito burst out laughing. Oh, it couldn't have been all bad. You guys hungry? I can whip something up. Sure. We can't say no to Aunt Yuki's delicious cooking. Aw, thank you. Kaito throws his brows and is just about to speak when Nikki chimes in immediately. Ordering takeout is not cooking. Kaito laughs and grins. Well, someone had to cook it. Nikki and Yuki both sigh. You're hopeless. You're hopeless. 
Well, that was scary and sink. They blink at each other, then laugh as Kaito and I join in. Anjuki and Nikki head into the kitchen together. I over top out, but they both respond with a firm no. I can tell when I'm not wanted. Uncle Kaito and I hang out until it's for it's time for dinner. After an amazing meal, we settle down and Nikki suggests another family movie night. With everyone else busy schedules, it's rare for us all for all of us to spend the evening together. Still, I hope this will become a more frequent thing. We stand up way past our bedtimes, watching movies, and cut will sleep on the couch as we giggle at her snores. We all decide it's time to go to bed. I return to my room and easily fall asleep. The morning sun gently pulls me out of my sleep. I yawn and stretch, feeling fully rested. Uh, after my roller coaster of the day yesterday, uh, actually, make them a roller coaster for a week. I'm just happy to finally have a day to relax. I take my time getting out of bed, and then I check the time. I realize it's already past noon. Good thing uh, there's nowhere I need to be. Tracking it off, I got lost in the deep recesses of the internet. Before I know it, the day has passed. Doing nothing can, be sh can sure be exhausting. <laughs> Is this still, is this going to keep going? Yes it is. As I'm about to go and... Sorry. As I'm about to go into the kitchen to grab a snack, my phone rings. It's a girl from Nikki. Now that I think about it, I haven't seen her all day. Of course I answer. Hello? Thank God you're home. She, is, she speaks quietly and seems almost out of breath. Can you pick me up from the bookstore? Her voice is uh, garbled, and I can hardly make out what she's saying. What? She pauses and has a lot of movement on the phone before she speaks again. Please, can you get me? Where are you? At the bookstore. Her voice is clearer, but it sound, but she sounds scared. Be there in a minute. Something doesn't seem right. All right, I'll be there in a few minutes. Nikki sighs in relief. Thanks. Moving up the phone, I hurry back to my bike. Nikki would tell me if uh, she were in danger. Wouldn't she? I try not to dwell on the thoughts, but pick up speed anyway. Luckily, traffic's on my side and I arrive a few minutes earlier than anticipated. Nikki waits for me beneath a street lamp a few feet away from the bus stop. I can make out Ken's dark hair beside her. It's a little strange that she's... Uh, not under the bus awning. And what's Ken doing there? Nikki straightens up as I uh, slow down. Flexed of blood stains her clothes and dark bruises mark her skin. Ken steps into light to grip me and I wince when I see him. His left eye and cheek is puffy and starting to turn purple. Blood drips down his face from a cut at his temple. He must have tried to clean it because his forehead is smeared with streaks of red. What the hell happened here? I park my bike and rush over to them. Nikki throws her arms around me and hooks me tightly. So glad you're here. Oh my god, Nikki, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You're bleeding. No, the blood's not mine. Is it Ken's? No. You look like hell. He tries to tiffle, then daps uh, on his swollen lip. His finger is now stained with flesh blood. He holds himself stiffly and leans onto the lamp of for support. He saved me from those guys. What guys? I don't know. There was a group of them. Three, I think, waiting for the bus. And when they showed up, they started saying all these things about me. They were being so gross and creepy, but I tried to ignore them because I figured the bus would be there soon and it wouldn't matter. And then one of the guys tried to put his arm around me. I freaked out. I guess I pushed him and he got really angry. And then, the other guy grabbed me and... My blood runs cold. He what? Did he hit you? Are you hurt? No. Nikki's voice trembles and her eyes glitter with tears. I want to pull her back into the hook when Ken slips his hand into hers and squeezes. Ken intervened before anything could have happened. She glances at Ken, smiling broadly. He came barreling out of the bookstore, screaming at that guy to let me go. And then, he punched him right in the face. 
The guy was super angry, and he and his friends ganged up on him. How do you get your bruises done? She frowns. I tried to stop them from ganging up on Ken. You what? Who are you thinking joining the fight? You could have been seriously injured. Nikki says to Joel. There was no way I was going to let Ken fight them alone. Especially not when this fight only happened because of me. I'm too stunned by her outburst to reply. Of course I'm not pleased that she put herself in danger, but a part of me is also a little proud. But I didn't really need to help. I raise an eyebrow. Ken beat two of them up by himself. The third one had to help them up so they could escape. What? I look skeptically at Ken. I wouldn't say he's scrawny, but he's no Muslim either. Ken shifts nervously. I think I can still make him I think I still make him uncomfortable. I have some experience with martial arts. Uh what do you mean some experience? You're a second down black belt. He's a what? I certainly was not expecting that. You drew yourself in harm's way to protect Nikki? Of course. Ken maintains eye contact and answers with convic conviction. Nikki blushes. Anyway, I told Ken he should go back inside, but he refused. It's not safe for her to wait alone. I take another look at Ken. Respect. There's a fire in his eyes I'd never noticed before. When he looks at Nikki, he isn't that timid kid trembling in his boots. He looks like someone who's willing to move mountains. I meet his eyes and nod. Thanks for being there for her. He blinks surprised but nods back. I only did what anyone would have done. Don't be so modest. You were amazing out there. Ken shrugs awkwardly, then winces in pain. Are you okay though? Uh, are you sure you're okay though? Maybe we should take you to the hospital. He shakes his head. I'm fine. Nothing's broken. I look him over. I don't know about that. I told him we should call an ambulance, but he refused. I promise I'm okay. I'm sorry for causing you such trouble. This is one of those rare times uh, I wish my ride could fit more people. Uh, do you at least have a ride home? He let me call his brother to come pick him up. We'll wait here until he arrives. I appreciate the thought, but... I would feel more at ease if you took Nikki home. Offer to walk into the bookstore. If you don't want us to wait with you, will you leave us walking back to the bookstore? It will be safer in there. I'm sure your co-workers will let you back in. They're probably wondering what happened to you anyway. You work there? Cannot. Then I'll definitely get you back inside. Realizing he's fighting a losing battle, Ken agrees. Okay. Nikki and I go to support him, but he manages to walk by himself. As we head into the bookstore, his co workers rush out to help. He's asking questions about what happened. Nikki and I sit with Ken as we wait for his brother to arrive. Nikki fusses over Ken and he lets her. As I watch the two of them, I pay close attention to Ken. He's calm, respectful, and polite, but most importantly, he makes Nikki smile. Let Ken know you approve. Hey, ten. Uh, ten. <laughs> Cries in the legible. Is it illegible? I don't know anymore. <laughs> it's been so long. Uh. Hey, Ken, can I talk to you for a second? He looks up at me with wide eyes, the, same, the very same expression that he wore the first time I met him. Sure. Amused, I lead him into a quiet area behind the shelves. I'm trusting you to take care of her. He blinks blankly before his eyes uh, open wide again, as his face goes pink. His bows, he bows at a perfect 90 degree angle. Of course. Thank you for your trust. You don't have to bow. He returns to an upright position. Sorry. Don't apologize. Sorry. I glare at him and he shuts up. <laughs> this is kind of fun. I think I might actually enjoy this turn of events. Okay, let's go back. 
Nikki wants to have questions as we return. What was that all about? Why wasn't I invited? Why did Ken bow? Yeah, Ken, why did you bow? I grinned deficiently at him, daring him to answer. Uh, oh, it's, uh, it's because he's, uh, my senpai? Nikki stares at him blankly, then shifts her attention to me. What did you do? Nothing at all. Isn't that right, Ken? Uh, uh, of course. Nikki pouts, but I can see a trace of a smile. I guess she's uh, glad we're finally getting along. A few minutes later, Ken's brother shows up. He convinces Ken to go to the hospital and thanks us for our help. With Ken safe, we head home. Nikki lets out a huge uh, breath when we step into the living room. Her face is unusually serious. She hangs her head and stares at her feet. I'm so sorry. Why? If I hadn't gone to visit Ken, I wouldn't have lost track of time and stayed out so late. And then I wouldn't have gotten into this mess and made everyone worry. Nikki, what happened wasn't your fault. She glances up at me. But if I... No, none of this is your fault. What happened is the fault of those guys. And if I find out who they are, I'm going to finish what Ken started. Nikki smiles weakly and nods. Finish what he started. Ugh. I mean, to be completely honest, he only made sure they, you know, ran away eventually. I would not just finish what he started. I would go the extra mile. I think I'll go take a shower. Sure. As soon as Nikki goes upstairs, Kaido pops his head out of the kitchen. Is Nikki gone? Yeah. He pauses and gives me another look. Did something happen? I debate telling Kaito about the incident, but I don't want him to needlessly worry. He looks like he has something else on his mind. It's fine. What's up? I heard back from the PI. What did he say? Ezra Wilson. The drunk driver? Yeah. What do you really know about him? He and Ned used to work together at Midori Energy. They run every project together and he used to come to the house uh, all the time while we were still growing up. I thought he and Ned were friends. My voice trails off. His blood alcohol was far over the legal limit. It's not like the cops would ask him about it due to his coma, nor was there any evidence which indicates this was more than a cut and a dry drunk, giving a driving accident. There was no incentive to investigate further, so that was all that was listed in the report. Well, it turns out Ezra was stalking your father. I frowned. That doesn't make sense. They saw each other about every day at work. Why? The PI read about a huge fire at Midori Energy the week before your parents' accident. He spoke to a few people and found out that the fire destroyed important documents which contained all the research for Midori's latest project. I whacked my brain. I think I might remember hearing something about the fire. The documents which were destroyed was your father's and Ezra's research. That's research? I tried to recall that right before the accident. He seemed a little more worried than usual, but otherwise didn't give any indication that something was amiss. Uh, shouldn't we have been devastated by something like losing years of research? Was he trying to protect me or was something else going on? Ezra didn't take the loss well. Right after the fire, Ezra accused your father of purposely sabotaging him by setting their research on fire. That wouldn't do that. It was his research too. Right. It didn't make sense. Nobody believed him and they chalked up his breakdown to stress. But he wouldn't let it go. He accosted your father many times at work demanding answers. It got so bad that he was assigned a leave of absence by the company. On the day of the accident, your parents had lunch at a cafe. Nikki called him asking for a ride. Yeah, I remember. The PI asked the wait staff if they remembered seeing your parents there, and they did. Ezra, too. He was there? Yeah. He'd followed them there and was already clearly intoxicated. He demanded that they pay him all the money he would have made upon completion of the project. You said your father owed him. Obviously, your father refused and continually maintained his innocence. Ezra became so disruptive, the manager had to forcibly remove him from the cafe. <laughs> Great, thanks for the whole f uh, voice lines. Uh, your parents uh, seemed, shaked, seemed shaken, uh, but tried to finish their meals as if nothing happened. That's when they received the call from Nikki. 
And I guess Ezra tried to kill them, but ended up running them off the road. Kaito nods, looking more grim than ever. Something doesn't add up. What reason is important enough to kill over? And if Ezra was driven to madness after losing his life's work, why was that barely affected? Then, then there's the convenient timing of Akira's copycat core. How much time has passed since the accident? Since the fire? Enough for the company to piece together just enough of the uh, research to turn a profit? And Kaito? He looks at me. I think the research that killed Dad threw off my core. He hesitates, then not slowly. You might be right. Wasn't there an encrypted piece of uh, the Valerie wasn't able to unlock? Maybe that can help make sense of this all. I need to take another look at it. I need to go look at my core. Uncle Kaito doesn't try to stop me. You do what you need to do. Just be safe. Thanks, Uncle Kaito. For the second time today, I race to the garage and up uh, back on my bike. Then I drive to Ace. The campus feels even more empty than usual. Even though it's after hours, I have no trouble uh, swiping it to the hangar. All is quiet except for the sounds of my footsteps. I cannot get to Eagle fast enough. As soon as I do, I plop down at the terminal and boot up the computer. I follow the instructions Valerie left for me and I'm greeted by the password scrumpting screen. She showed me earlier. Uh, she said there was a hint here. Let's see what it says. The screen is a scroll must have words with no rhyme or reason to them. I read through a couple of times, make sure my eyes don't skip any words. Most of these words mean nothing to me, but a select few stand out. Cricket, Moo, Sir Hopsalot. Uh, those are childhood nickname, nicknames Dan gave me. Each of them had a story, but none of them uh, were very long lived. The ultimately nickname that stuck with me was an embarrassingly long one. Uh, embarrassingly long time was Meatball because I was born uh, when I was born my cheeks were big and wound like meatballs the servant story to tell was the time I first started school the teacher called Drew for roll call and I stayed silent so she marked me absent after she'd gone through the list of names I said she didn't call mine she asked if my name was Drew and I responded with no my name is Meatball I've got Meatball at home for so long I didn't even know my real name. That must be the answer. I apparently have to type a Meatball into the password prompt, but fingers over the enter key before pressing it. The prompt disappears and a video pops up on the screen, but breath catches in my throat as Dad looks straight into the camera. There are dark circles under his eyes and worry lines around his mouth. His hair sticks up uh, at odd angles and his clothes are smudged with dirt and oil. He notices the recording light is on, and he tries to fix himself up before giving me a weak smile. The fact that you are watching this now means something must have gone wrong. He sighs, as his, and his voice grows thick. I'm sorry. I try to swallow the lump in my throat and ignore the sting of tears in my eyes. This isn't the dad I remember. The dad I remember had a booming laugh, uh, which shook up the room. He was sure of himself, and never had regrets. By putting this technology in Eagle, I have potentially endangered you. But I... I don't know where else I can keep it safe. Meteor Energy doesn't fully understand the scope of this research. They're willing to sell it to anyone without considering the consequences. Companies which would weaponize this technology will cause irreparable damage. They could create energy explosions 13 times the force of a nuclear bomb. He says as Jean and lifts his case back towards the camera. His eyes are unusually steely and cold. That's why I caused the fire. I burned all copies of my research to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands. Dad runs his hair, hand through his hair, a gesture he would do whenever he was stressed or worried. It's hard to completely destroy 20 years of research. Especially when this technology could bring so much good. The possibilities would have been endless. This new format of energy may function similarly to existing methods, but the fundamental principles are vastly different and have far wider scalability implications. A shadow of his old self returns while he talks and I catch a glimpse of a genuine smile. That was always a bit of a dreamer. Then his face becomes grim. And that is why this core is sitting in eagle now. His piercing gaze stares uh, Straight into my soul. I'm sorry for getting you involved. I'm sorry I couldn't follow through with what I started. 
But most of all, I'm sorry I wasn't able to tell you this in person. His eyes look glossy and glittered too much beneath the light. I probably don't say this enough, but I'm so proud of who you've grown up to be. I know, if you're watching this, that I put a heavy burden on your shoulders. But I trust you will make the right decision. My only hope is that you can find it in your heart to forgive me. Death glanced behind him. Something must have spooked him because when he faced the camera again, he smiles feebly and his voice is quiet. Take care of your sister. Goodbye, son. The video cuts off abruptly. At first, I'm too stunned to move. The image of dad is seared into my eyes. He was the same, yet so unfamiliar. As his face slowly fades away, I'm surprised to feel wellness on my cheeks. Wetness on my cheeks, whoops. He knew. He knew exactly what he was doing when he hit this technology inside the eagle. And now I understand why I wasn't allowed to help program the core. I understand why Dad seemed almost obsessive about completing eagle. It now also makes sense why I never noticed the difference between this core and any other core. Dad never matured the technology. But he must have set it up to an overdrive creation, probably not before he... He set up the overdrive to only that happen once, so I began to search for answers. His last words rang on my head. Goodbye, son. He knew the implication of his research and entrusted it all to me through the gear we built together. I glance over at the eagle, partially obscured by shadows. The darkness, uh, the darkened blue no longer seems warm and inviting like the sal a salty spray of the ocean, but feels dangerous and cold like a winter sky. I try to bring up the video once more so I can hear his voice one more time, seeing his face, even though it's not the one I want to remember, but I can't. It was a one-time initiation. Uh, as I try to process the situation, I don't know what to feel. I recall Dad's hollow cheeks uh, and the, sh the shadow of pain in his eyes. Of one more thing I'm certain, I cannot keep using the core knowing all this. But what will I do about the research? I mean, here's the thing. Illudian already has it. It doesn't matter if I destroy it to keep it protected. Someone literally already has it. Th this question has... Or this... This choice solves nothing. Destroy it all. I saw an eagle and a gathering flame burns away the pain in my chest. This technology has already destroyed my family. Dad would still be alive, Mom would still be alive. Nikki would be happy finishing up school for childhood friends. It's amazing how this one device could wipe that all away in one in, in an instant. I don't even want to imagine what would happen if I fell into the wrong hands. Crawling up the ladder beside the eagle, I open up the cockpit and key in the sequence to access my core. The heat bubbling in my chest arises when I see it. Like a beating heart, it gives off a faint pulse of energy. I open the terminal screen in my cockpit and able to find the source information for my core. After wiping all the data, I send a possible run instead. Uh, the low glow continues to brighten more and more. After zapping noise, it becomes an opaque object. Uh, as far as anyone would know, the core is short-circuited. After closing the core's access panels and exiting the cockpit, I climb back down the ladder. As I stand there, suddenly I feel so tired and so lost. Without thinking, I pull my phone and dial the first name that comes to mind. Frosted, how's it hanging? I just did think we could meet. Oh, uh, sure. He sounds surprised. Any place you have in mind? Where are you now? I can meet you. I'm just chilling in my room. Come on over. Thanks. See you soon. 
We hang up uh, the phone. Uh, as if in a daze, I make my way towards his dorm. Joe greets me with a white smile, but it drops as soon as he sees my face. He quickly ushers me in. I'll hardly greet any of his dorm mates we pass before we settle in Joe's room. I sit at his desk while Joe flops onto his bed. What's going on? You seem tense. There's something I need to tell you. Okay, I'm ready. My car is gone. Show blinks. Gone where? Nowhere, just gone. Like into oblivion. Yeah. He blinks again before sitting, sitting straight up. Holy crap, your core is gone? That's so messed up. Who would do such a thing? I did. Broseph, this isn't time for jokes. No, seriously, it was me. I destroyed it. He continues to stare uh, incredulously at me. Why? I sigh and sh share with Sho all that I've learned. My story comes out in pieces and Sho eventually asks questions to help him understand the order of events. Eventually, I finish my story. Damn, that's intense. I know. I'm not sure if I did the right thing. I acted emotionally and maybe should have taken the time to really think things through. No way. You were right to do what you did. You think so? Without a doubt. I let out a breath I hadn't realized I've been holding. A huge weight lifts on my shoulders. I hadn't realized how anxious I was about the decision until someone else validated my choice. Your dad might not have been able to make the decision himself, but he was right to trust you. You're like the most logical guy I know. I grin weakly. Considering your version of logic, that's not too difficult to achieve. Hey! He matches my grin. How are you doing otherwise? It still sucks. I keep wondering about what could have happened. I know it's easier said than done, but you've got to let it go. Once you give in to the what ifs, it's really hard to pull yourself back out. You end up obsessed. You don't even realize what you're doing until it's too late and life passes you by. He shakes his head. Then you would have just wasted the life your father fought so hard to give you. He's right. Wondering about the impossible only bring more heartache. I need to accept what's happened. I take what I've learned and move on. I nod. You're right. I can't let what I've learned bring me down. I'm looking at a friend who always has my back. In a moment, I have clarity. I don't need to focus on the past because my future is worth exploring. And my friends will be there with me every step of the way. And here we go. Credits.
Thank you for playing Ace. We hope you enjoyed it. We'd love to hear uh, and incorporate players' feedback into future projects, so feel free to let us know your thoughts on the discussion boards or in a Steam review. With that formality out of the way, whew, what a ride it's been. For original supporters, thank you so much for sticking with us. For new players, welcome to the Pixel Fate family. Uh, while the adventure of Ace stops here for now, Pixel Fate is always exploring new options. Please feel free to check out what we're up to at pixelfate.com. Thanks again. I don't even think I have any of the endings. I think I just got the basic bitch simple ending. Right? I want to see the main menu first before I say anything. Game. Still here? There's nothing else. This is the Marvel Marvel movie where you get special hidden teaser. I get the feeling I just set an expectation that we will have something after the, this text. Look, I got nothing, so stop trying, okay? Just press escape or right click on that mouse button and be on your very way. Really? Still here? Okay, maybe I might have something to share. Are you ready? Here it goes. Ace Academy Supernova. Sorry, that's not actually a thing. No, I will say that Mock Reveal somewhat ended up looking pretty cool. For realsies though, we're excited about the next version of our current development. Check out pixelfade.com for details. Thanks again for playing. Goodbye. Goodbye. The, the game ends here for real. The game ends here for real? Question mark? You're in a thought. Hold on, Pixel Fade. Did you really present the game like that? Yes. No, not acceptable. <laughs> We're sorry? It is a crowdfunded project, and we did our best to give, uh, given our resources. Actually, the length ended up almost twice as long as what we initially planned. Planned? Planned. We shut that as long as we could. So we have more resources. I could have had a longer game. Indeed, as an indie team, your support uh, will directly impact the scope for projects, including future ones. All right, I'm all interested. How do I help? Oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> Kryzen shilling their Patreon. Alternatively, we can't find. Yep, 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 yep. Thanks for the info. Yep. No one Drew. Thank you for your consideration and understanding. Have a great day. Wow! Okay. I didn't even get any of the special endings. I thought I might actually still get the scenes with an ending, but nope. I got the basic... I, I think I got the most basic variant of an ending you can get. So, yeah. That was Ace Academy. However, like I've mentioned a couple of times before, there is still Kiri After Story, which uh, plays out... I don't know actually where, uh, but Kiori, of course, as one of the characters from Ace Academy, uh, one of the pilots on the team actually, so I think that'll be great, seeing as her character is actually quite great, so have a good one and good day.